Chapter 6 Wednesday, May 12, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 We're still walking along the South Platte River. I'm ready for some excitement. No, I'm not. That's a silly thing to say. Excitement on the trail seems to be someone drowning or dying of snakebite. Excitement is not something I want or need. Not in those ways. The girls are enjoying having a new father in their lives, but I know they still miss Tom something fierce. Especially Amanda. I doubt if Sally will have any memories of Tom at all, and she will only think of Jamie as her father. I did tell Jamie last night that I plan on staying with him for the rest of my days. I don't believe in divorce, and I would never be able to leave him. I suppose we'll learn to forge a new life together. I'm still struggling a little with my feelings for Jamie. I just wish I could feel like a faithful wife to Jamie and not feel like I was betraying Tom all at once. There has to be a way. I need to figure out exactly what it is, so I can put it into practice. Margaret had the pie baking the entire time they ate supper, and when they were finished, she carefully cut the dessert, giving everyone a piece. When she sat with her own piece, she only had eyes for Jamie, who had a big smile on his face. This looks and smells delicious. How you can bake something so wonderful over a fire, I will never know. He took a bite, closing his eyes, to savor the taste. It's the best thing I've ever put into my mouth. Margaret laughed. Let's not get so dramatic about it. The other men echoed Jamie's compliments, but she didn't care. Jamie's opinion was the only one that mattered to her. She'd made the pie for him, after all. After supper, she cleaned up the dishes as usual, and afterward, Jamie smiled. Let's walk. Margaret nodded. All right, but not for long. The girls need to sleep soon. Jamie scooped Sally onto his shoulders and the four of them walked forward, in the direction the company was traveling. Thank you for making dessert tonight. I don't want you to feel like you need to do things like that though. While it's greatly appreciated, I don't want to add to your workload. Margaret shrugged. You've done so much for the girls and me that I can do a little extra work to make you something you'll enjoy from time to time. I thank you for thinking of me that way. Jamie wanted to tell her he was thrilled with how she was warming up to him, but he felt like if it was spoken aloud, everything might change. Besides, with the girls listening, he didn't want to mention anything private about their marriage. Amanda skipped along between them. I think Mama should make pie every day. It tastes good. She seemed unaware of the private nuances that were part of the conversation, which was for the best in Margaret's opinion. Margaret laughed. I think we'd all get sick of pie if I made it every day. I wouldn't get sick of it. And Sally wouldn't either. Well, that's nice of you to say, Margaret said, but I'm still not making apple pies every day. They are too much work, and we'd run out of apples quickly. I didn't even know you brought apples along, he said. Jamie had only brought along exactly what the list said for him to bring. He had a small amount of dried fruit, because it was on the list, but he hadn't thought of it again. Well, I've been looking for berries in season for days now, but I haven't seen any. We had the apples that I dried last fall, so I brought them, thinking they might just be a nice treat. It was strange to think that when she'd been drying fruits and vegetables in the fall, she'd expected to eat them with her girls and Tom. Instead, she was on her way to Oregon and sharing the food with men she didn't know and a new husband. Life had certainly changed for her in a very short time. I'm glad you did, he said, smiling at her. I got some dried fruit in Independence as well, but I think it's at the bottom of all the other food. He wished he knew what the right course of action was. Should he just smile and say thank you? Could he thank her with a kiss? What kind of fruit, she asked. I have no idea at all. I told the merchant to put some in my pile of goods I was purchasing, and I never thought about it again.
Maybe I could find it for you in case the apples get low. Margaret smiled. I'd like that a lot. I could add whatever fruit into my rotation of things to cook. With their marriage not being one of love, it didn't make sense for him to take liberties that she hadn't granted him, though he wanted to take her in his arms and... Well, thinking about such things did nothing to help his discomfort. Instead, he'd think about her kindness. My friend Betty will start eating with us tomorrow evening, she said. She wants to meet some of the men, and she feels like she'd be more comfortable doing it over supper. Jamie was surprised. Is she looking to marry? he asked. She feels like she's a burden to her sister and her family. So, if Betty finds someone suitable, she would like to marry. Like might be too strong of a word for what Betty was thinking, but she didn't feel like she should share all of her new friend's secrets with Jamie. I think it's wonderful that you're helping her. Knowing that will help me to keep the conversation going throughout the meal. Jamie had found that if he directed the conversation over suppers, it made things easier on Margaret, so he made sure to always have a few topics prepared to discuss. He certainly had time to think about it while he was driving all day. That will help a lot. I have a hard time talking around the men, and I have no interest in getting married, because I already am. I can just imagine how hard it must be for her. She's as shy as I was before I married Tom. Margaret remembered how difficult it had been for her to even look at a man, let alone have a conversation. It was good she'd married so young, because it had eased her out of her shell, gradually. Betty was having to emerge very quickly. I can see that you're still a little bashful. It wasn't something he'd considered, but since she'd brought it up, it seemed to fit well. Tom was very outgoing, and he pursued me for a while, before I could agree to him courting me. I definitely had to be nudged into it by my parents. Nudged was really too gentle of a word. Her mother had told her that it was time for her to marry, and if she didn't choose Tom, someone would be chosen for her. Now, she was glad, but at the time, she'd been petrified of all that marriage entailed. And here, I thought you took one look at Tom and knew you'd spend the rest of your lives together. Jamie was jealous of Tom, and he hated when she brought him up. He knew his feelings were unreasonable, but he didn't know how to stop them either. If she didn't talk about her late husband, it would be strange, but when she did, it bothered him. He needed to figure it all out, and soon, before she realized he was being crazy. She laughed. That's what he would have had everyone believe. We met in school, and he tried to walk me home for over a year, before I agreed. I was content to read books and never think about having a bow. She'd imagined spending her life in a giant room with books surrounding her. Margaret had known it would never happen, but she loved to daydream about the idea. Jamie could believe that. It was odd that she'd been so very much in love with her husband, though. I've never even seen you read. He was surprised to realize it was such a great pleasure of hers. The only book I didn't sell was my Bible. The rest had to help fund our trip. Margaret kept her chin up as she told him, but she really hated to admit how poor she and her girls had been. And still were really. He shook his head. I hate that for you. I wish I'd known you sooner, so I could have helped more. Margaret sighed. I don't know that I would have accepted the help. There were so many family members unwilling to help that I would have assumed you had ulterior motives. I needed to get to know you first, which is what I did. She was glad she had. She could never have let herself marry him if she hadn't gotten to know him so well first. She trusted him, and that was saying something. I do think that's good. He frowned a little. I just wish you hadn't had to go through that tough situation alone. I wasn't alone, though. I was with my girls. Jamie nodded. Your girls would help you get through anything. Amanda nodded, the first time she'd said anything in a while. Margaret had forgotten she was even listening. We were there for Mama, the whole time. It was hard for us to lose our Papa.
but it was so much harder for Mama. She cried at night while holding the music box, even after she'd sold everything else. The music box? he asked. Of course, he knew about it, but it would be good for him to hear it from Margaret. Margaret took a deep breath. On our first anniversary, Tom gave me a music box. It was just three days after Amanda was born. It's always been special to me. I would wind it for the girls as they fell asleep at night, and since Tom died, I have considered it my most treasured possession, other than my girls, of course. I see. You still have the music box? he asked. She nodded. I should have sold it when I sold everything else, but I found I was too sentimental. I had to keep it, and I still listen to it at night sometimes. It's nice to wind it and know that Tom's hands have touched that very box. I feel like he's closer and watching over me and my girls. Jamie had guessed a lot of what she told him, but the jealousy grew again. I'm sorry I'm not Tom. Margaret stopped walking and looked at Jamie in surprise. Girls, you go play. Stay where we can see you. She took Sally from his shoulders and set her on the ground to run and play with her sister. Why would you say that? You're not Tom, but you have done so many things that would have pleased him. You're taking care of his family, now that he can't. He shrugged. I guess I just get tired of hearing of Tom's perfections. I want to be the man you look to, and it will always be Tom. He hoped the bitterness he felt toward her late husband didn't come out in his voice. Margaret carefully weighed her words. She had to make him understand if it was at all possible. I'm very sorry I've made you feel like you weren't as good as Tom. What you have done for my girls and me is absolutely the most wonderful thing any man could have done. I respect you and I genuinely care for you. And I will quit talking about Tom so much. He noticed she hadn't said she loved him, and he was glad. He didn't want her lying to him to save his feelings. Running his hands through his hair, Jamie squatted down on the prairie as Sally brought him flowers. I'm glad you're my daddy, Sally said softly, and then she ran back to where her sister had been playing with her. I'm glad you're their daddy, too, Margaret said. I know I seem to be taking forever to get used to being married to you but if you'll just give me a little more time. I didn't expect my life to take this turn, and I've been struggling since the moment I realized Tom was dead. I've had no one to lean on but myself. It's hard to learn that I don't have to be everything to my girls anymore. Jamie nodded. Not unless you decided to divorce. Margaret shook her head. That decision has been made. I won't divorce you, Jamie. I just need a little more time to let our marriage to progress naturally. He stood straight, and his eyes met hers. Really? He hadn't expected her to say that any time soon, but he found himself getting excited at the prospect of having her be a real wife to him. She nodded. Really? I'm not ready for an intimate relationship yet, but I will be before too terribly long. I'm a great deal more attracted to you than I want to admit even to myself. He cocked his head to one side as he looked at her. Does that mean I can kiss you when I want to? She laughed softly. That's the first question you ask me? Yes. I find you very attractive, and I won't deny what I want is a real marriage. I wish you'd told me that before we married. Margaret felt trapped in a way. She was attracted to him, but he wanted more from her than she was ready to give. Soon, she'd be ready though. If not for worrying about Tom, she'd have been ready at that moment. Jamie sighed. I know I should have been more truthful about my feelings, but I didn't want to scare you away, because I do genuinely want to help you. At that moment, Margaret felt as if Tom were speaking into her mind. She knew that Tom would approve of her marriage to Jamie. Jamie had given up the hope of love to marry her and help her and her girls. She took a step toward him and wrapped her arms around his neck, kissing him softly. Jamie didn't have to be asked twice.
He gathered Margaret closer to him and kissed her passionately, his tongue tracing her lips and then moving into her mouth. She let out a low moan, wishing she could get even closer to him. This man made her feel a passion that surprised her. With Tom it had been a slow-building passion, one learned over time. But with Jamie, she felt things so quickly and easily. She'd been nervous about her wedding night with Tom, but with Jamie? She was ready to find someone to stay with her girls that night. But who? Hannah had already interrupted her own honeymoon, if the trail could be called that, to watch her girls. Mary and Bob left camp every night and had trouble keeping their hands off one another when others were around. And then it hit her. Betty. She was unmarried and felt like a burden. Margaret pulled away from him. Get the girls back to camp. And she turned and ran as fast as her ridiculously sore legs would take her. She went straight to the cauldron's wagon, where Betty was sitting on the ground while the rest of her family had obviously gone somewhere. When she noticed Margaret, she smiled. Hello. Did you come to talk about books? She looked positively thrilled to have a visitor who was there for her and not for her family. Margaret shook her head. No, I came to ask you for a big favor. Betty's eyes narrowed a little. What's that? Well, you know Jamie and I are newlyweds. We'd like some time alone tonight. Would you sleep at my camp with the girls? I think we want to sleep away from camp. Betty nodded. I understand completely. She got to her feet. I'm going to write a quick note for Bernice, and then I'll go to your camp. Margaret hurried back to her camp and set up the tent for the girls, and then she grabbed Jamie's bedroll he'd used when he was a bachelor on the trail alone. She put both where they would be easy to grab as soon as Betty arrived, knowing now she was ready for a physical relationship with Jamie. Maybe she wasn't ready to love him, but it didn't matter when it came to doing her wifely duty, which would please them both. She truly did enjoy that part of marriage. Jamie had a frown on his face when he returned to camp, holding hands with both of the girls. Are you okay? he asked. What kind of a husband was he that his wife ran away every time he kissed her? Was there something wrong with her or with him? Yes. Margaret turned and spotted Betty walking toward them. Have you met my friend Betty yet? she asked. Jamie was more confused than ever but he smiled at the shy woman. Hello, Betty. Betty nodded, not looking at him. Thank you for coming to stay with the girls tonight, Betty. I have the tent set up, and we'll be back before the gunshot in the morning. We both tend to be the first two in camp awake. Jamie had no idea what was going on, but Betty seemed to. Margaret looked at her girls. You two obey Miss Meeks. We will, Amanda said, hiding a yawn. Margaret smiled at Betty. They're both exhausted. She pulled the music box out of her wagon. Play this for them, and they'll go right to sleep. It felt strange letting someone else touch her treasured possession, but she trusted Betty. Betty nodded, still not looking at Jamie. Thank you again, Margaret said, grabbing the pillows and Jamie's bedroll. Then she started walking, but this time she went in the direction they'd just come from. Jamie followed her, still a little bewildered by what exactly his wife was up to. She wasn't telling him, and she was usually good about telling him what she was planning. He wasn't sure he could spend much time completely alone with her without touching her intimately. They were a hundred yards from camp when he grabbed her arm. Where are we going? he asked. Somewhere we can be private and have a wedding night, Margaret said, refusing to look at her husband. She felt like she was acting like Betty, but she didn't care. She certainly couldn't look him in the eye and tell him she planned to do that with him. Are you sure? Jamie asked, wondering why he was looking a gift horse in the mouth. If the woman was interested in a night of passion with him, then who was he to argue with her? He was all for the idea. She nodded. I'm ready. Well, then what are we waiting for? 
The Irish brogue came out strongly in his voice as he grabbed her hand and pulled her further from camp. Jamie took the bedroll from her and spread it out on the ground, and then he threw down their pillows. He turned to her, hoping she'd have an idea just how to do this thing, because he had no clue. He couldn't tell her that though. She'd think less of him, for certain. Margaret didn't hesitate. Instead, she walked straight into his arms and resumed the kiss she'd interrupted a short while before. He pulled back after a moment. You're not going to run again, are you? She laughed. I think I'm finished running. This last time I ran because I had an idea for how to be alone with you. It worked. I see that. I'm glad. With that, he kissed her again, his hands roaming her back. He didn't know the protocol for making love with his wife, but hopefully she would let him know if he did something he shouldn't. She pressed closer to him, aware that her nipples were already tight as they touched his chest through the fabric of their clothes. Knowing that they needed fewer clothing between them to really enjoy themselves, she brought her fingers to the buttons on his shirt and carefully freed each button from its hole. It was well after dark, so she didn't mind getting completely naked, though there were people close by. Jamie didn't realize what she was doing until he felt the warm night air against the bare skin of his back. He pulled back from their kiss. If you're undressing me, does that mean I can undress you? She nodded emphatically. Of course. Jamie immediately reached for the buttons at the back of her neck. Now why do women have to contort themselves when they want to undress, while men can see what they're doing? It makes no sense to me. Having never undressed a woman before, he'd never thought of how hard it must be for them until that very moment. Margaret laughed softly. Because women make the clothes, and we realize that we're superior where fashion and undressing are concerned, so we can do it, while men have bigger hands and it's harder. Is that so? He raised an eyebrow as he looked at her, realizing just how joyful she was making this experience for him. He'd imagined only removing as many articles of clothing as absolutely necessary, and getting it done with no talking at all. Margaret obviously had other ideas, and he couldn't be happier with his pretty little bride. She nodded. Absolutely. Now that his shirt was off, her hands went to the buttons at the front of his trousers, and she freed every button. When she pushed his pants off his hips and down to the ground, he stepped out of them. Wait, I'm behind. I need to get you naked faster. Jamie couldn't believe how aggressive she was being in their lovemaking, but he found he was thrilled. She obviously had more experience than he had, and it made things easier for him. I win. When? This was a contest? Jamie had no idea what was wrong with this woman. She wasn't the wife and mother he had come to know so well. It was as if she'd transformed into someone else entirely. Margaret nodded. That's something you don't know about me yet. I'm horribly competitive, and I think everything is a contest. He'd only seen what everyone saw from her so far. Now he would get to know the real woman underneath. The woman Tom had referred to as Meg. That is definitely something I didn't know. He shook his head. Turn around so I can see what I'm doing. I'm fumbling in the dark. She grinned, but obeyed him immediately. As soon as she felt her dress fall around her hips, she pulled the pins from her hair. She'd given up on wearing a corset and several layers of undergarments as soon as they'd left Kentucky, and she didn't care if her waist widened a bit. Pushing the petticoat she wore down over her shoulders, she felt a pool at her feet. Then her underdrawers, and she was naked in front of him. Instead of turning to face Jamie, she leaned back against him, knowing he would never let her fall, and she was right. His arms came around her and cupped her breasts, toying with the peaks. Jamie trailed kisses along her neck and bare shoulder. He wanted to see her with nothing on, but he knew that she was probably shy about her nudity, which was most likely why she had turned her back to him. Instead, he moved to the blankets they'd spread out, 
pulling her with him. He knelt on the ground. Join me. His voice was deep and rough, and his brogue was stronger than even he had ever heard it. To his surprise, Margaret turned to face him before joining him on the blanket, and he saw what he'd secretly been fantasizing about since he'd met her back in Independence. I don't think I've ever wanted anything in this world as much as I want to make love with you right now. Margaret smiled, her eyes traveling down the length of him and landing on his erection. I can tell. He felt himself blushing, glad that it was too dark for her to see. I guess it's kind of obvious. I like it, she said softly, her fingers trailing along him. One of my favorite parts of being married is making love. I'm going to want to do it often. He swallowed hard. The woman was absolutely unbelievable. Everything he learned about her was better than the last thing. I guess we should get to it then, huh? Margaret smiled. I'm certainly ready for you. I was while we were walking with the girls, and I couldn't remember why I was making us both wait. To torture me? he asked softly. Her laughter filled the night air, and he wondered how he had never known this part of Margaret existed. Uncertain what to do next, he reached for her shoulder, and she shook her head. Instead, she pushed him onto his back, and she put one knee on either side of his hips. He had never expected her to do that, but when she took his member in her hand and guided it to her opening, his eyes met hers, and he could see she truly did enjoy this. Her eyes closed as she sank down onto him, and he wanted to tell her to open them again, but the look of pure bliss on her face was too exciting. It only took them a moment to find their rhythm, and the sound she made told him why she'd wanted to wander so far from camp for their first time together. He found he couldn't stay quiet either, and together they made sounds that no one else should hear. She tightened around him, and she let out a gasp, arching her throat. He reached up and pulled her down to him as he moved one last time and spilled his seed within her depths. It was a while before he knew what was happening around him again, but she was snuggled close to him, a satisfied smile on her lips. Thank you, he whispered. Margaret chuckled softly. I think you know I found it as pleasurable as you did. Jamie wasn't sure. For him it was an emotional experience, because he loved her so much. Could it have been the same for her? He gathered her closer to him and closed his eyes, refusing to worry about it. For now, he had the woman he loved in his arms, and his body felt truly sated. How could he complain? Chapter 7 Wednesday, May 12, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 it was a most interesting day. We had to stop just before noon for our midday meal, because of some repairs that needed to happen after we drove over some particularly bumpy terrain. The women and children walked a hundred yards to the south of us, so they were able to miss the rocky parts, but when we suggested to the captain that we all drive in the same area, he told us that we didn't know what we were about. I'm afraid that the loss of the captain's wife is taking a heavy toll on him. He's become more dogmatic than ever, and he's refusing to listen to the opinions of any of the other men in the company. His boys are running wild and causing mischief. None of us are able to approach him because of his severe temper. I've tried hard to keep the fact that he's acting worse than ever for Margaret and the girls, because I don't want her to worry about the future of our company. The captain said something about fording the river this morning, but from the maps I've looked at, We'll do much better if we wait another day or two, because the river is not only narrower, but not as deep. I pray he listens to reason. My wife is one of the most wonderful people I have ever met in my life, and I just hope that starting our marriage the way we did with her and her girl's safety in mind will not keep us from making a true connection in the future. It was still dark out when Margaret woke, and she judged it to be about an hour before dawn. She glanced over at Jamie, who had held her most of the night, and she'd felt protected in his arms. It was strange to think that this man she'd married was such a tender lover when he held her in his arms at night. Jamie woke and felt Margaret's eyes on him. He smiled and pulled her to him, wanting to hold her forever, 
but feeling very strongly that Captain Bedwell would refuse to stay in one place for the day so Jamie could bet his wife well. He chuckled at the thought. Are you laughing at me? Margaret asked, peering at him. No, I am laughing. I was just thinking that I wanted this to go on forever, but that Captain Bedwell wouldn't be willing to not travel today, just so I could bed you well. She laughed. That's a terrible turn of phrase, but you're right. He wouldn't be willing. However, I believe we have a little time for you to bed me well right now. I wish we had a bed, of course, but we can make the prairie grasses work in place of a mattress. Jamie grinned. Really? Oh, yes. She reached for him and kissed him passionately, one arm toying with his shoulder, while the other moved much lower, under the blankets. A short while later, he lay on his back trying to get his breath back. I think I like being married to you, he said. He knew he did of course, but he was still afraid that he'd frighten her away if he was too vocal about his feelings. She grinned. I know I like marriage to you. Now let's wash up and get back to camp. I need to fix breakfast. I need you to keep your strength up. You do, do you? He shook his head. I never thought my wife would be so willing. Truthfully, he was surprised she'd allowed him to make love to her before they reached Oregon, let alone before they crossed the South Platte River. Well, if you'd prefer an unwilling wife, I could probably figure out how to make that work, or at least pretend to make it work. Margaret gave him a playful grin and shrugged. She wasn't sure she could pretend to be unwilling now that they'd made love. He laughed. I like you just the way you are. They both dressed quickly before going down to the river and washing. When they returned to camp, they were the only ones stirring as usual. I'll go milk the cow and get you some milk. Margaret nodded, already intent on building a fire. It had been nice to be just a wife for a few hours, but now she was a mother again, and her babies would be waking up any minute. She remembered that Jamie and Amanda had talked about their favorite trail breakfasts being Johnny Cakes and bacon, so she got out a slab of bacon and carefully sliced it into thick strips. She put her iron skillet on the fire and while it heated, she mixed the batter for the Johnny Cakes. She'd cook the bacon first and then fry the Johnny Cakes in the hot oil left behind. Everything tasted better when fried in bacon grease. Jamie was back a short while later, and when he saw what she was making, he smiled. Bacon and Johnny Cakes I feel like a king this morning. Margaret grinned over her shoulder at him as she carefully guarded the bacon to keep it from burning. It does sound good, doesn't it? I thought about adding potatoes to it, because I'm starving, but I'm just going to make a few extra Johnny Cakes instead. Sounds good. He took the coffee off the edge of the campfire and poured himself a cup. I never liked coffee before the trail, but the doctor scared me into only drinking coffee. He tried to keep their conversation on the mundane, but all he could think about was how she'd been the night before. And early this morning. I know. I drank coffee on occasion, but I didn't like it much. Now I'm afraid to drink anything else. I even let the girls drink it. Margaret was worried they were too young to drink the bitter beverage, but the doctor seemed to think it was the only thing safe for them to consume, so they did. What else can you do? he asked. The musket was fired, and Margaret looked at the tent. Betty emerged, looking rested, and the girls climbed out right after her. That bacon smells good. Betty said. I made enough for five. Eat with us. Margaret felt like she owed the other woman at least breakfast after she'd stayed with the girls all night. Betty looked hesitant for a moment. Are you sure? I'm positive, and it will make eating with us tonight easier, don't you think? Margaret responded. It will. Betty looked like she was having an internal debate. All right, I'll join you. Let me run to our wagon and let Bernie snow before she starts cooking. Margaret nodded as she turned the bacon. 
Hurry back. I'll have it ready in ten minutes. Amanda got out the plates and the cups. Is Miss Meeks eating breakfast with us, Mama? She is. Were you good for her? Amanda shrugged. All we did was sleep. We didn't have a chance to be naughty. Would you have been naughty if you had the chance? Jamie asked, curious as to what Amanda would say. Amanda tilted her head to one side and thought about it for a minute. Probably not. I like it when Mama is proud of me for being good. He looked at Sally. What about you? Would you have been naughty? Sally shrugged. Not unless there was something fun to do that was naughty. He couldn't hold back his laugh, and he saw that Margaret's lips were twitching as she poured the Johnny cakes. Is that so? Sally nodded. I like to have fun. Maybe that was why Amanda was always in charge of her younger sister. Sally was a little too fun-seeking. Betty came back a moment later, a cup of cornmeal in her hand. She went to Margaret's food storage and poured some in before squatting beside Margaret at the fire. How can I help? Margaret shook her head. I was trying to pay you back for watching my girls. You didn't have to replace any food. I wanted to, Betty said, shrugging. Now, how can I help? Margaret laughed, putting a Johnny cake and a single piece of bacon on a plate. That's for Sally. She'd like butter if you don't mind. Not at all. Betty obviously liked to be busy to help her nervousness. Margaret was the same, so she understood well. Minutes later, they were all sitting and eating breakfast. Jamie smiled at Betty. We really appreciate you staying with the girls last night. Betty nodded, keeping her focus downward. I was happy to help out. Margaret knew it wouldn't be good to let Betty die of embarrassment talking to Jamie. Are you walking today? she asked, trying to get her friend's mind on anything other than talking to a man. Betty nodded. I think so. If you don't mind me walking with you again. I'd like to get to know the pastor's wife a little better as well. You'll love Hannah. She's truly one of the best people I know. I noticed that yesterday afternoon. I only wished she'd joined us sooner. Betty shrugged. I may ride in the afternoon, though. The boys do need someone to lie down with them, and I don't think it should always have to be Bernice. I came along to help her out on the trail, after all. That makes sense. You never know, she might be happy for the chance to rest. Like the boys would let her rest. Betty said with a grin. They lie there, but they fidget and wiggle and talk the entire time. I don't know why she still tries to get them to nap. Margaret smiled. That doesn't surprise me in the least. Jamie smiled. They really are wiggly boys. Betty nodded. Oh, yes, they are. I haven't ever really been around young boys before. We used to watch our cousins, but they were all girls. Now we are trying to figure out what we're supposed to do with two rambunctious boys. Just love them. I don't think there's anything else to be done, Margaret said. Jamie felt a pang in his chest as he heard Margaret talk about love. He wanted her to love him so badly, but he had no idea how to make it happen. He hoped he wasn't going to spend the rest of his life with a woman who stayed with him out of duty and not love. Margaret caught a strange look on Jamie's face, and after she finished doing the dishes, she sought him out. Was something wrong at breakfast? she asked. You had a strange look on your face, and then you got really quiet. He shook his head. What could be wrong? I'm married to the prettiest woman in all of the world, and she gifted me her body last night. The latter part was whispered for only her to hear. And this morning, Margaret whispered. And probably again later. She put her palms flat against Jamie's chest as she stood on tiptoe and kissed him softly. I'll see you at the noon meal. Only if there's pie left. There are two pieces left. One for the girls to share 
and one for my husband. Jamie smiled as he watched her sashay away. She was truly something else. As Margaret walked with the others that day, she had a new lightness to her step. She felt so much better about her marriage with Jamie. It was like realizing that Tom would have wanted her to do what was best for her and the girls this way had taken the guilt out of things. She and Betty walked side by side with Hannah and Bernice while the girls ran with the Cauldron boys. I'm not sure I want my girls marrying your boys when they're older, Margaret said softly. Bernice laughed. I'm glad they're too young to worry about that yet. Besides, I hear everyone is planning on settling close together, and we're heading to our friends. That's true, Margaret didn't want to think about saying goodbye to Bernice or Betty anytime soon. I'll just have to work on convincing you to settle near the rest of us. Betty smiled. I'd like that, I think. Margaret put her arm through Betty's. Then I'm keeping you. Bernice let out a gasp of mock insult. You can't just keep her. She's my sister. Try and stop me, Margaret said, a grin on her face. Betty simply laughed, enjoying the easy camaraderie of the small group. She was obviously feeling a great deal more comfortable about walking with the other women, now that she'd made a couple of friends. At lunch, Margaret served what was left from the roast and potatoes of the night before. She was pleased they all had meat in their systems to make them stronger as they kept going. She wished she could serve more than jerky on a regular basis, but they would make do with what they had. After she'd fixed all the plates, she sat down beside Jamie, her body alive with tingling at his nearness. How long before we cross the river? Margaret asked. Captain's looking for a good spot. He thinks that if he can find a narrow section, we'll cross as soon as tomorrow. Our meal is going to take longer than usual today, because there were some wagon troubles. Did you notice we stopped early? Margaret shook her head. No, I don't have a watch. I just go when I'm told and stop when I'm told. Which is all you really need to do. Jamie shook his head. Captain Bedwell lost a back wheel, and the cauldron's wagon broke a yoke. We went over a rocky patch, and several of us tried to convince the captain that driving even a hundred yards to the east would be better, but you know the captain. Nothing is a good idea unless he thinks of it himself. There's probably time for a good long nap today. I doubt if we'll get everything fixed in time to go at all. Margaret's eyes were shining with happiness. Really? Does that mean we'll have to move on Sunday if we stay? She didn't want to give up her Sunday because she looked forward to the sermon and the day of rest, but she loved the idea of resting that afternoon. Probably not. The captain will just push harder the next couple of days to make up the time. You know how he does. I do. Margaret looked at her girls, who had just finished eating. Yes, you may go play. We may be staying here all day, so listen for the gunshot. Amanda nodded, stood up, and straightened her dress, and then she took Sally's hand and ran toward the other children who were already starting to play. I'm glad they've made friends, Margaret said, watching them. I was worried no one would want to play with the girls who had no father. I don't think children care about those things as much as adults do, he responded, one arm going around her shoulders. I wish I knew if there was time to get away for an hour or two. She laughed. I'll make sure we get some time alone this evening again. I think sleeping under the stars worked well for us. Just as long as you're sleeping close to me, I'm happy to sleep in the middle of a buffalo stampede. I have a feeling they would wake us more often than we would prefer. She stood and moved to the dishes. I'll clean up from our meal, and then we can spend some time. Just not doing what you want to do. She winked at him with a grin as she started to gather the dishes. He watched her, enjoying every movement she made. Now that he had gotten to know her in a new way, he could imagine her moving that way with no clothes on, but after a moment, he realized he needed to think of something else 
where he would display his hunger for her to everyone around them. Bob walked over and sat down beside him, and he realized he and his friend hadn't talked nearly as much as they did before he'd married Margaret and become a husband and father all in one day. I don't think we're going to be moving again today. Captain is trying to explain to Jensen how to change a wheel on a wagon, and Jensen isn't taking it well. The man has been a blacksmith for years, and the captain thinks he knows better? The man is going to make life even more difficult for us if we don't end his reign of tyranny. Jamie laughed. Don't you think reign of tyranny is taking it just a bit too far? I think he's fine, he just wants everything done his way. As he spoke, he nodded slightly toward Margaret, who had her back turned, but had gone still as she listened. He hoped his friend would understand he wanted to protect Margaret from the rumblings of mutiny in their company. Bob looked chagrined and nodded. I guess when you're in charge, you get to decide how things are done. Jamie smiled and nodded. Well, if they take a long time to finish, maybe we'll have an afternoon off. We're way ahead of the schedule we set for ourselves. But not ahead of the captain's schedule. I know he's going to push us harder if we can't go today. Bob shrugged. That's all right, though. We'll still make it to Oregon in one piece. I think I'll go see if Mary wants to go for a hunt. Could you use some extra food if we find something? We could always use extra food, Jamie said. With Margaret still cooking for others, the more we get the better. Bob got to his feet. I always love the first night after a kill. Gives us something new to eat. And then we can dry it to eat later. Very smart. Jamie smiled at his friend. Get a deer or a buffalo, will you? Then there will be more than enough to go around. Antelope? Bob asked. Mary is lamenting, she hasn't killed an antelope yet. Jamie laughed. Maybe you should make her fish with you. Bob tilted his head to one side. Maybe I'd be better than her at fishing. Might be worth trying. Jamie laughed, knowing his friend wasn't bothered by how adept his wife was with her musket. As Bob walked off, Margaret turned around, the dishes done, and she stored them in the wagon. Then she walked over and sat in the grass beside Jamie. What's happening with the captain? she asked softly. She wanted to know everything that could happen with the company. It wasn't that she was nosy. She truly worried for the safety of her girls if the captain was as unhinged as Bob had made him sound. Jamie sighed. He'd never intended to tell her that there were people getting ready to split the company in two if necessary. He's just being the captain. You know how he thinks he knows better than anyone else. Reign of tyranny sounds more like Napoleon than a captain taking a group of people to Oregon. Margaret wasn't going to give up her questions until he told her everything, and she felt she knew Jamie well enough to know when he was giving her half-truths. Some of the men have started calling the captain a tyrant. Jamie shook his head. He's gotten a lot more unpleasant since the death of his wife. No one is quite certain what he's thinking, but his actions are getting scary at times. Margaret shook her head. But he's the only one who knows the way to Oregon. The wagon ruts are pretty obvious. And I have a good map. We could make it, even if we didn't follow him. I think he'd do better being an advisor instead of a leader. She frowned. I worry about the boys. I know Hannah offered to watch over them right after Mrs. Bedwell died, but he found the way she treated them too restrictive. He said that a boy only needs his mother until he's finished nursing. He nodded. I'm not surprised. Not even a little. The captain is an odd man, and he's not very compassionate at all. Jamie shrugged. I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. There are a couple of men who are talking about mutiny. We'd refuse to follow the captain, but I don't know how many of us would go along with it. I'm not even sure that I would go along with the plan. There's already a plan? Margaret couldn't believe she'd been so oblivious to things going on in camp, 
Jamie worried he'd said too much, but his wife deserved the truth. Cauldron and Applegate are discussing branching off and letting the head of each household decide which company they want to be part of. They want to do it on Sunday, because we'll all be in camp, and it will be a good day to discuss things. Margaret was stunned. She was particularly glad she was no longer the head of her household. No, that was Jamie. What will you do? She wouldn't even let herself think about which outcome she'd prefer, because there was no point. He was the man, and she wouldn't argue with his decision. That was against God. What do you think? His father had always included his mother in important decisions, and he felt like doing the same with Margaret was the right answer. She looked surprised. You would listen to my opinion? Of course, I would. You're just as affected by this decision as I am, and I want you to be happy with what we do. Margaret thought for a moment. When the girls and I joined the company, the captain told me I had better keep my girls under control. He made me feel like he would leave the three of us behind if the girls were rowdy. I wasn't worried, because I know my girls are well-behaved, but it was an embarrassing conversation. He told me that children without a father have no hope for growing up to be decent human beings. If I hadn't been worried about leaving as soon as we could, I'd have waited for the next company to assemble. Jamie shook his head. That makes me want to lean with Cauldron and Applegate. He was furious for her, and he wished she'd told him sooner. He'd have waited with her for the next company. Though he did like the idea of being as far as they could before September. Me too. I don't think the captain is a reasonable man, but more than that, he's not a caring man. Then I'll tell Cauldron I'm on his side. Isn't his one of the wagons that's broken today? Yes, it is. It'll be easy for me to go over and offer my help and tell him what we've decided. The weave in his sentence filled Margaret with a sense of ease. Tom had always left her to make decisions about the children and the house, but anything else was his decision. She'd never questioned it. But having the right to give her opinion in an important matter? It pleased her. Thank you for caring about my opinion, Jamie. Jamie nodded, getting to his feet. I will always care about your opinion. I promise. With that, he walked in the direction of the cauldron's wagon. Instead of taking a nap as she'd intended, Margaret found Betty and Bernice. Speaking in a soft voice, she asked, Do either of you know about the mutiny being planned in our company? Bernice looked over her shoulder at the wagons being worked on, and she took Margaret's arm and pulled her toward the river and away from the company. My husband is leading it with Mr. Applegate. Jamie just told me. I had no idea anything was happening. Margaret looked at Betty and saw that her friend looked as surprised as she'd felt. Are the woman not supposed to know about this? Bernie spit her lip. I was told not to say anything, but I said I wouldn't deny it if someone asked me about it. Margaret sighed. Why are women always left out of these plans? She shook her head. Six months ago, I accepted easily that women aren't going to be involved in plans that affect anything but their home and children, and sometimes, they're not allowed to voice an opinion even then. But today, Jamie asked me which way I thought we should go in this. He wouldn't have if she hadn't directly asked him if he was certain, but she was glad once he'd admitted it was happening that he'd given her a voice. What did you tell him? Betty asked. Her friend's hand grasped hers as if she was hoping for the answer to go one way, and Margaret knew which way her friend wanted her to lean. I said that I would rather follow a man other than the current captain, Margaret answered. I don't think he is fit to lead us. That's what my husband keeps saying, Bernie said. Hopefully it will all happen peaceably. She looked nervous that it would be otherwise, but Margaret refused to concern herself over much. Margaret nodded. If the way Jamie said it was planned happens, I'm sure it will be very peaceful. Chapter 8 Thursday, May 13, Sup, TH, Slash Sup, 1852
We stopped after our noon meal yesterday for the first time without someone being ill or giving birth. The captain's wagon lost a wheel, and the cauldron's wagon was broken too. From what I understand, we could have kept going if not for the captain's stubbornness to have things done a certain way. He actually argued with our blacksmith over the right way to fix a wagon. If you ask me, the man is exhibiting signs of insanity. I found out yesterday that a mutiny is planned because the men no longer trust Captain Bedwell to lead us. They are planning on telling him they will split the company on Sunday. I pray it goes well. The girls and I greatly enjoyed an afternoon of rest in camp yesterday, and the men played music for us all. Jamie played several songs, and then he put down his guitar and left the other two men playing, while he came and danced with me. I was surprised, but also pleased. We've been able to do none of the normal things attributed to courtship while on the trail, and I do wish we had more time alone. It would be nice to get to know him in a more relaxed atmosphere. I'm feeling a great deal more for him than I ever imagined. He's a good husband to me and a good father to my girls. I'm so pleased he took a chance on a lonely widow woman and asked her to marry him. I hope I can make him happy because he's been a godsend to me and my girls. The rest of the week was a time of tension in the company. Margaret wanted to speak with Hannah and Mary about what was happening but she was certain Jamie and Bob were on the same side, and Jamie had asked her not to speak with the other women about it. She listened to her husband and kept silent no matter how much she wanted to talk about it. She continued to speak with Bernice and Betty, because she knew they were aware of the heavy secret, but she couldn't tell her other friends. By Saturday evening, Margaret wanted it just to be over with, and she knew the other women who were aware of what was happening would feel the same. Even the women who had no idea why there was extra tension among their ranks definitely knew there was some. After they settled in camp on Saturday night, Margaret cooked and did her laundry, and then she joined the rest of the company for music. It was her normal Saturday night routine, and she knew that she must continue to do as she was told. Jamie had told her over supper that the captain had wanted to cross at a spot other than the one the other men had in mind and no one had stopped to even entertain his order. They had simply moved on. Every time she'd spotted the captain, he'd looked incensed with anger, and Margaret had done her best to stay out of his path. When the women had finished the laundry and all were listening to the music, Mr. Cauldron stepped in front of the three men who always played for them. I'm very sorry to interrupt our music and revelry for making it through another week but there is something of grave importance we must discuss. Margaret had not heard Mr. Cauldron speak often, and it was strange to hear him so serious. He seemed more like a man of humor than a man who spoke with gravity in his voice. Margaret pulled her girls closer to her. She hadn't expected the decision to be made until the following day, but perhaps it was best this way. She wouldn't have to spend the night fretting about what could happen, she looked around her and saw that many of the women looked confused, but every man looked like he was ready for the final showdown, so to speak. Mr. Cauldron explained his reasons for thinking the company should split, and he explained that he and Mr. Applegate would be co-captaining a new company, one that would happily coexist with Captain Bedwell's. You may all continue to follow Captain Bedwell, or you may follow Mr. Applegate and myself. How do we know you won't get us lost? The doctor asked from his place behind Mr. Cauldron, where he held his Jew's harp, ready to play once again. Margaret couldn't take her eyes off Jamie, who was careful to look at no one as he sat holding his guitar. Mr. Cauldron laughed. Applegate has a map. We know how to follow it, and we have eyes in our heads. All the ruts are still there from last year. There should be no problem finding the Willamette Valley. The captain, who had been sitting quietly up until that point, walked to the front of the crowd. You may follow these mutinous men, or you may continue to follow me, the only man in this company who has safely gone to Oregon and returned. He looked as if he was having trouble staying on his feet without swaying. From the looks of him and the slurring of his speech, Margaret could tell he was well into his cups. 
The man was drunk and trying to get the company to follow him. She was certain it was the last nail in his coffin. One by one, the men of the company stood. Each one said they were following Mr.'s Cauldron and Applegate. No one was planning to follow the current captain. By the time it was over, Margaret felt sorry for Captain Bedwell, but not sorry enough to be willing to follow the man. No, she and Jamie had made the right decision. Bedwell removed his hat and threw it on the ground. You're a bunch of ungrateful halfwits. With those words, the former captain stormed back to his wagon, dragging his boys along with him. There was silence for a moment in the big group, but then Mr. Cauldron turned to the musicians and said, Play something happy. The entire tone of the evening changed with that, and there was much celebrating by everyone. Margaret was relieved it was all over, and they could move on. Betty made her way among the other emigrants and sat with Margaret. I told Bernice I'm staying with the girls tonight. Margaret smiled. I'd like that if you don't mind. She and Jamie were having a hard time mastering the art of making love in silence. I don't mind at all. I know Bernice likes her time with just her husband as well. Betty had confided that the cauldrons left her with the boys while they sneaked away often as well. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for allowing me to eat meals with you. Betty sighed. I wish I had an easier time talking to strangers. Margaret smiled at that. Her friend had yet to speak to any of the men at supper, but she had finally looked up from her food once or twice. Until she'd met Betty, Margaret had thought she was the most bashful woman in the world. Now she knew better. You're improving with every meal. She tried to encourage her friend as much as she could because she really did understand how hard it was for a shy woman to come out of her shell. Betty laughed. Sure I am. I don't feel like I've done anything good at all, except helping you with your cooking. You'll get there. At least all the men know you can cook now. When the music was finished, Jamie walked over and picked up Amanda, who was sleeping soundly. Margaret took Sally, and the two of them carried their children back to their wagon, where Margaret had already set up their tent. Betty is going to stay with the girls again, Margaret said softly, knowing that it would please Jamie. We're going to have some time alone. Jamie's grin was the only reward she needed. The man did enjoy his alone time with her. He reached into the wagon for his bedroll and their pillows, and they headed out onto the open prairie. I was surprised when Mr. Cauldron brought everything up this evening. I thought he was waiting until tomorrow. With as drunk as Bedwell was getting, it just felt right to do it tonight. He doesn't get as mean when he's drunk. He walked back behind where they had just traveled and found a spot a good distance from the circle of the wagons. Margaret had little experience with any kind of alcohol at all. He always drinks on Saturday nights, doesn't he? I think that's the real reason he wants to stay in camp on Sundays. It's not about the church service. She felt bad for the captain's children. No, it's not, Jamie said. Since his wife died, he's really changed, and he was never what I would call a pleasant man to begin with. I'm glad that part of things is over, Margaret said softly, going into Jamie's arms. Now we can move on to the fun portion of the evening. Jamie kissed her softly. I approve of this plan. Mr. Bedwell's wagon was still in the circle in the morning, but no one had seen the man or his children. They had no idea if he would continue on with them or try to make it on his own. The church service was particularly poignant that afternoon as Pastor Scott talked about forgiveness. It doesn't matter what a man does to you. Jesus would have you forgive him. Margaret sat on one of the tree stumps that had been turned into a makeshift pew by emigrants before them, and she listened carefully. They all knew Jed was talking about forgiving the former captain for his harsh ways, but she had no idea if the talk would work for them. The time under the captain's rule had been difficult. There was music and much laughter again that evening, and Margaret was stunned by how much happier everyone seemed. 
with the sense of doom gone from their camp. It was a completely different group of people, now that their captaincy had changed. And it finally felt right. When they rolled out Monday morning as they always did, the Bedwells were part of the group, and the boys were much more subdued than Margaret had ever seen them. They walked quietly with the women, instead of running alongside the wagons or playing tricks on the other children. It was an odd sight to behold. When they stopped for the noon meal, Margaret doled out the bread and jerky for her family, sitting as close to Jamie as propriety would allow. The Bedwell boys were very quiet this morning, she whispered. Jamie nodded. The captain said nothing as we pulled out, but he put his wagon in line with the others. It was strange to see him without him yelling orders and foaming at the mouth. Margaret giggled. They walked with the women, not even with the children. Perhaps things will be easier now. The new captain's plan on continuing the pace that Captain Bedwell said as long as it's reasonable. There will have to be times when the company slows for various things, but we're enough ahead of schedule that they won't have to break us all getting to the next camp on time. He shook his head. I'm glad we made this move. Things just felt better yesterday and today. Don't you think? He hoped she was feeling the difference as well, but the women saw things very differently than the men did. She nodded. It's been so much easier for the women as well. Mrs. Linden is about to reach her time, and she was worried the captain wouldn't allow us to stop for long enough for her to give birth. That won't be a problem with Applegate and Cauldron in charge. Jamie had no doubts the new leaders would be better for their group than the old one had been. As he watched Margaret, he saw how much more comfortable she was with him, but he had to wonder if it was because she was developing feelings for him or because she was simply more used to him. He wanted it to be the former, but he had a feeling it was the latter. He wasn't sure how he'd ever thought he could bear to be married to a woman he loved when she didn't return his feelings. She caught his eye and smiled at him, and he wanted to look away. She enjoyed his body, and she needed him to help with her children, but she still loved the man she'd married first. And now he had to admit the truth to himself. He needed her love as much as he needed air. He smiled back at her instead, refusing to let himself be angry with a dead man. They'd keep going on together. The following morning, Jamie spotted a broken-down wagon at the side of the trail. It was a relatively normal thing to see as they made their journey, so he wasn't surprised until he saw a boy, around 13 or 14, jump down from the wagon. It was Jamie's turn to be in the lead, and he stopped driving. Look! He yelled, pointing to the south, where the boy was standing. He could hear the yells of the men driving the wagons behind him to stop and he jumped down, walking over to the boy. There was a fresh grave he could see behind the wagon, and his heart went out to this young man. Are you alone? he asked. The boy shook his head. No. My pa got real sick, and the company refused to let Ma move on without him. She told us to go, but we stayed with her anyway. Jamie's eyes widened. How long ago was that? His heart went out to the boy, and he thought about how the Bible spoke of God's people taking care of the widows and orphans. Why would this family have been left behind? Saturday morning. They moved on without us, but I couldn't let my ma stay here and die with no man to protect her. How many siblings do you have? Three. Two brothers and a sister. We're going to be fine. The boy stuck his chest out obviously trying to show that he was strong enough to get his family through this terrible time. Jamie wanted to kick the wagon master who had left these people behind. Jamie heard feet on the dirt behind him. His father got sick and died. The company didn't want the mother without the father, so all four children stayed with her to protect her, he explained quickly, glancing over his shoulder. Most parents would have forced their children to move on with the rest of the wagon train, but perhaps the circumstances had been different somehow with this family. Cauldron nodded. Applegate? You thinking what I'm thinking? 
Yup. Cauldron shook his head. I'm really sorry for your loss, but you can go to Oregon without your pa. If no one else is sick, then we're going to get your wagon packed back up, and you can join our company. The boy's eyes widened. Really? The other captain said no one would take us. He looked around him as if he thought the whole thing was a trick being played on him. We will. Where's your ma? Mr. Cauldron kept his voice soft and even as he spoke with the young man. The boy ran off to the other side of the wagon. Ma, the next company is pulling through and says we can join them. Oh, Stanley, you know better. No one is going to want a widow and four kids. We'll be making our home here whether it's legal or not. Cauldron and Applegate shook their heads at one another and walked around the wagon in front of them. Ma'am? Cauldron asked, removing his hat. I'm sorry for your loss. I don't think it's safe for you to stay here, though, so we'd love to have you join us. You already have what you need. We'll help you pack up, and we'll all be on our way. Jamie turned and walked back toward the wagon train, his eyes drifting over the people there until he saw Margaret. He walked toward her. I think you could help this situation. A woman lost her husband, and she doesn't think a company would really want a woman with no husband and four children. Margaret stood still for a moment, knowing she could help but wondering how. I'll go talk to her. She hurried over to the wagon and spotted the woman walking close to her. My husband sent me to talk to you. You see, I lost my husband a few months back, and I had to sell all of my property, and my girls and I went to Independence alone, planning to go to Oregon where we could get free land. The woman looked at her in surprise. They let you join them? Margaret nodded. The first captain didn't like the idea of me coming along with two girls with no father, but we have two new captains now, and I'm sure they'll help as much as they can. Is your son old enough to drive the wagon? The boy rose to his full height. I'm thirteen, ma'am. I've been driving the wagon for a while, because Pa got hurt, and then he got sick. Margaret smiled. It sounds like you're a young man parents can be proud of. She looked back at the mother. I'm Margaret by the way. Margaret Balling, I mean Margaret Pruitt. I married less than two weeks ago. I'm Katie Gabriel. That's Stanley. He's my oldest. Well, Katie, I hope you'll let us repack your wagon for you, so you can join us. I'd be proud to call you my friend. Katie started weeping, and she grabbed Margaret's hand and clung to it. I didn't know what I could do. I've been trying to figure out how we're going to survive. You'll continue with your plan. Margaret knew she must sound bossy, but the other woman had to understand it was the only way. When Tom had first died, she'd needed people to tell her what to do. Now Katie needed to be told what the best thing for her children was. At Katie's nod, the men got to work, nudging her son Stanley, to help them. Soon, other women came over and saw what was happening, and they pitched in. Within minutes, the wagon was packed and ready to go. Margaret, still holding Katie's hand, introduced her to her friends. Will you be walking or riding? she asked her new friend softly. Katie shook her head. I'll walk. Stanley can drive. She seemed shaken by how much was happening so quickly but Margaret understood better than most. Margaret had felt like life was happening to her right after Tom's death. It was as if she was living a life, but watching from outside herself. Margaret noticed the other three children then. They'd obviously been down at the river, getting cleaned up. The biggest of the three frowned. Ma? What's happening? This kind company has told us we may join them we're going to get back on the trail. The children stood there for a moment and then the girl, the smallest of them, began to cry. But we can't leave Pa. This is what your Pa wanted us to do when he was so sick. We're obeying him, but we're doing it a little later than we'd planned. 
Katie walked to her little girl and gathered her into her arms. This is the right thing for us to do. The little girl nodded. All right. Within a few more minutes, the wagon was in line with the others, and they continued on, but now Margaret's group of friends was walking a little wider path on the trail as they all tried to support Katie and get to know her. Where are you from? Hannah asked their newcomer. Katie's eyes were full of sorrow, but she answered immediately. We lived in Pennsylvania until Stephen decided that we needed to go to Oregon for free land. You see, he worked in a factory there, and all he really wanted was to be a rancher. I was able to convince him to wait until my little Anna was five, but then he said we had to leave. And so, we did. Cholera? Mary asked. Katie shook her head. One of the wagons ran over his whole leg a week ago. Then on Friday night, it started turning green. We didn't have a doctor with us, and I begged the company to wait, but they wouldn't. He died within 24 hours of us being left behind. I'm so sorry, Bernie said. I'm glad you joined our company. My husband and Mr. Applegate will treat you very fairly. That was your husband who talked to me? The red-headed man? Bernice nodded. It was. He's a good man, and you'll find he'll treat you very well. Katie nodded, sniffling slightly. Margaret knew that when her husband had died, she had barely been able to complete a sentence without breaking down for more than a week. She was impressed with Katie. I worry about Stanley, my oldest. He's driving the oxen, but he thinks it's his job to take care of me, but he's only thirteen. The trail makes men out of boys, Betty said softly. It was her first contribution to the conversation, but Margaret was thrilled she felt comfortable talking to the older woman. It meant she was making some progress where her shyness was concerned. You just let us all know what you need these first few days, Margaret said softly. It's hard to try to go on when the man you love is gone. Katie nodded. I need to carry on, though. My children need me. They do. And that's what makes it possible to keep going. At least for me. My girls needed me. As if on cue, Margaret heard a wail coming from where the children were playing. She recognized the cry as Amanda's and she picked up her skirts and ran in the direction of the cry. What's wrong, baby? Amanda was on the ground, holding her foot and crying. I stepped in a hole. Her face was covered with tears, and Margaret knelt at her daughter's feet and removed the child's boot. Looking at the hurt ankle, Margaret sighed. I think it's sprained. Can you ride with Jamie until the noon meal, and we'll have the doctor look at it then? Margaret didn't want to be a burden, and they'd already lost some time that morning by stopping for Katie and her children. Amanda nodded, but the tears weren't stopping. Margaret picked up her daughter and carried her toward the front of the line of wagons. She'd gotten behind when she stopped for her, and she had to walk quickly to reach the front. She was out of breath when she reached Jamie, who stopped immediately. What happened? he asked. She stepped in a hole. I don't want to hold everyone up again, so I told her she could see the doctor when we stop for the noon meal. I want her to ride with you. Already, she was thinking about the money she'd saved and how much of it would need to go for the doctor's fee. Jamie shook his head. No, he needs to look at her now. If she has a broken bone, there's no reason for her to ride in the wagon in that much pain when he can set it now. He set the brake and jumped down from the wagon seat, taking Amanda from her mother. He went back four wagons, knowing that the doctor would be in his designated place. She fell and hurt herself. Can you look at it? Dr. Bentley nodded. I can. We're not going to get very far today with all the stops we're making, he said good-naturedly. He climbed out of his wagon and went to the back to get his medical bag. Set her on the ground, and we'll see what we see. A short examination told him that the ankle was most likely just sprained. She'll need to keep off it for a couple of days, 
but I think she'll be playing with the other children by the weekend. Oh, good, Margaret said, covering her mouth with her hand. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Bentley nodded. Now do you want to ride in the front of the wagon with Jamie, or do you want to ride in the back? Amanda put on a brave face. I want to ride with my daddy. Sounds good to me. The doctor patted Amanda's head as he closed up his bag with his doctor's tools. As Jamie carried Amanda back to their wagon, Margaret asked the doctor in a soft voice, How much do I owe you? The doctor looked surprised. I'm just like everyone else in this company. We're all using our skills to help each other make it to Oregon. That was my contribution for the day. Margaret frowned. She'd been charging the man for his meals. You'll get two weeks of suppers free then. That sounds like a wonderful trade to me. Dr. Bentley climbed back into his wagon. Now you go back to walking with the others, and don't fret about that girl of yours. She's going to be just fine. Margaret walked back to the other women, but it was hard not to worry about Amanda. She'd never really been injured before, and it was frightening for her to watch her daughter cry the way she had. Is she okay? Hannah asked immediately. Her girls had never been hurt before, and she felt silly being so nervous, but this was her baby. She is. She sprained her ankle, and she needs to ride for a few days. The doctor said she'd be playing with the others by the weekend. Margaret smiled, but the smile felt feeble to her. She should have been watching the girls better. Hannah was holding Sally's hand as they walked. It was obvious her younger daughter was shaken as well. Trying her best to put on a happy face, Margaret kept walking. What else could she do?